So I'm Francis Campoy, and today I'm going to be talking about Polymer Gopher. Uh, that's a very awesome name. It's basically about building web apps on App Engine with, bo with both Go and Polymer. So a little bit about myself. I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform, but I joined Google to be, well, I joined the developer relations team to work with the Go team specifically. Uh, I'm a gopher. I write Go all the time, except when I have to write JavaScript, like today, and I hated myself a little bit. Uh, and I'm not a front engineer, really, at all. Uh, and I think that this is an important point because you will see that the app that I'm going to build looks good, which is surprising. And that's because uh, Polymer helps you do these kind of things really easily. OK, so the, the talk is going to be pretty much structured at the beginning, and then not at all. So first, I will do a little bit of an introduction to what is App Engine. We're going to be building everything on that technology. So what is App Engine? Why, why should I use it? Then I will explain the app that we're going to build, which is called Polymer Gopher. And finally, I will actually live code it. Uh, let's see if we have time. And let's see if I remember how to do it. And finally, at the end, there will be pizza and Q&A. Uh, there's already pizza. And if you have questions, you can also ask them. So. Cool. OK, so how many of you know Angry Birds? <laughs> cool. OK, that's completely rela related to the topic. So Angry Birds is a game about, ger about birds that are not happy. Uh, and it's a huge success. And they have one thing, which is they have these weekly tournaments. Uh, every Monday, there's a new tournament that starts. And a bunch of people, like hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people, connect to try to win those tournaments. So they have Monday parts, bursts. This is what their traffic looks like, pretty much. So you can see it's very, very calm. And then on Mondays, it goes up. And the unit is, uh, is in unicorns, because that data is confidential, so I cannot share it. But you can see the idea is how much it increases. All of a sudden, you're going to need a huge, uh, huge amount of uh, machines to handle that traffic. Now, if you were using your own machines, or if you, if you were using uh, Compute Engine, for instance, where you decide how many instances you have, how many instances you should have? Well, enough to handle that peak, and a little bit more, just in case, right? So most of the time, more than half of your machines could be idle, couldn't, be, couldn't do uh, anything. So to do that, what they use is a pension. They solve that problem with App Engine. So App Engine, basically what it is, it's, it's a place to run your apps, which is a sandbox environment. So there's a lot of things that you cannot do. There's constraints, such as uh, you cannot run any language that you want. Uh, we're actually removing that with managed VMs. But today, I'm going to be talking about only App Engine. So with App Engine, you can use only Go, Python, Java, and PHP. And you can install third-party libraries, uh, other than the ones that come with the language in the language itself. So if you want to do image processing and you want to use some C++ library, AppNG is not really for you. That's not going to work. Again, with managed VMs, that problem is solved. Uh, in exchange of those constraints, what you get is something that will scale uh, directly well, uh, with your code, so with your traffic. So if you have a peak like they had, that's going to work. You don't have to care about it. It will just work. Now, if you don't have any traffic, the good thing is that you won't have any instance and you won't play anything. So everything that I build myself, I build it on App Engine for, with my personal account. I don't have billing activated with my personal account, and I have never paid. So there's the free tier is actually pretty high. So this, this is great for me for, for personal development. It's great. And if it turns out to be super successful, well, that will still work. OK, so this is pretty much. So on the bottom side, you can see the blue line. That's the number of instances that, that uh, start when the peak arrives. You can see that it's way too much. <laughs> it's way too many. But that's just because we're actually ready for a bigger peak. So if the traffic peak, uh, the traffic peak was not that, but 10 times more, we could still handle that. But since most of those instances that started were not actually used by your traffic, you see the, the green line there? That's the line, that's the actual build. Uh, the number of hours there, are, the, the number of instance hours that were actually built. So you get a lot of scalability without not really paying for it. So it works pretty well. 
OK, so if you have one instance and you have one database, that works. You have 100 instances in one database. Well, if you have 1 million instances in one database, that's going to be a problem. So how, that, how does that scale? Well, you could have multiple instances for the database and handle the replication and so on. Or you could also do something else like using a non-relational database that is fully managed and you don't have to care about anything in there. And that's exactly what Data Store is. Data Store is a non-relational database. So if you've used like MongoDB or things like that, it's pretty, pretty much the same. And it also auto-scales with your needs, meaning that you don't have to choose an initial size and then uh, upgrade to another size. It will just keep on growing with your data. It's fully managed, so it doesn't go down, basically. Uh, and they use it like uh, with data, uh, Angry Birds, they use it pretty much for everything. They just store everything there. And that's what we will use today in our app. Uh, something important about Data Store is that it's actually powered by two technologies that we created at Google, Bigtable, that powers things like Gmail, for instance, so it's pretty powerful. That scales really well. And then there's another thing called Megastore. And Megastore will replicate all of your data across multiple data centers in different regions. So if we lose one whole data center, you will not lose a single byte. So that's pretty useful. And this, this is the, the full schema. Now, I'm not going to get into much detail, but all of those things are actually built on App Engine, uh, completely on App Engine. Everything works on App Engine. And you see there's two logos for App Engine. That's the old logo for App Engine, which I think is better than the new one. But <laughs> If you have all of uh, those two, that's actually two different modules. In App Engine, you can have multiple modules that are independent types of servers, which all belong to the same app. And the good thing about this is that you can, you can write them in different languages. So you could have one in Java, another one in Go, another one in Python, and so on. So that could be pretty useful. And we're going to also use that today. OK, now the question. How many developers do you think that work in this project right now on Angry Birds? 20? Seven. Seven. One. What? Yeah. Uh, there's one developer that manages fe new features, and they are not adding many, uh, and bugs, and they ha don't have many. And then everything else, all DevOps, DevOps are making sure that the, uh, the app stays up. That's on us. So that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're basically, now they're doing all the things, rather than maintaining, rather than making sure that Angry Birds doesn't go down, what they do is making new games to try to be even richer. OK, so now Polymer Gopher, which is going to be almost as successful as Angry Birds, hopefully. Uh, it's uh, App Engine app, and we're going to use modules. The, the front end module is going to be written in Polymer. Uh, which is not a language. So it's actually HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And that's none of the languages that I said that the App Engine supports. But we're actually cheating, because that, those are completely static. So we're going to be ser serving static files. That's everything we're going to be doing with the front end. And then the back end is the one that is going to be doing things. And that's written in Go completely. And we're going to store all the data that we have in the data store. And we're going to communicate with Cloud Endpoints. I will, explain, I will explain what Cloud Endpoints is in a minute. We're going to be building this beautiful app that is actually live right now. So you can see, let's make it bigger. Uh, you can create a new node and say, Brian is there. Joe is amazing. And <laughs> we can find a logo. Uh, Go for, go for logo. Uh, no, not that one. <laughs> go for goal and logo. We're going to get one image, the image. Going to get that super long thing. Going to put it here. If you are building a good app, that's not the best way of <laughs> having avatars. <laughs> I know. And I just created it. Oh my god. <laughs> there you go. And now we have Brian there say, saying that Go is amazing. Then you can say, oh, yeah, I love that comment. And you can go back here and remove it. It will disappear. And if you refresh, you still get the same things because everything is backed up in the data store. So we're going to be building this from scratch today, except for the front end. Uh, the front end is actually not that hard. And all the code will be uh, open sourced soon. Uh, I will send it for review today. And 
some days should be open sourced. Okay, what else? So this is the architecture of what we return to full screen. Oh, there you go. So this is the architecture of what we're going to be building. We're going to have all the data uh, is going to be stored in the data store. Our backend will access it and provide a REST API to the front end. And the front end and the back end will be connected through the REST API that is actually created with cloud endpoints. And cloud endpoints is a really cool thing because basically it allows you to generate REST APIs with discovery documents. And a discovery document for a REST API is basically just a description uh, in JSON of what your API can do. And with that, we can actually generate code. So if you, if you have a description, um, I just said the word and I forgot it. Um, discovery document, if you have a discovery document, there's a lot of tools that will generate code for you. So with Eclipse, for instance, you can auto-generate code in Java, so you can build your, uh, your Android apps easily. For our case, it will generate JavaScript libraries for us, so we don't have to care about exactly how to do the calls. Everything will just be auto-generated, and also works with iOS. So yeah, uh, works for Pyth uh, Java and Python, and it actually worked to make sure that it actually works in Go now. So uh, that's something slightly new, uh, and it generates code for iOS, Android, web apps. But it's completely technology independent, so if you want to generate code for other languages, it's actually easy. Uh, you just have to parse a JSON and figure out how to generate that code. So how many of you have used Polymer before? OK, not so many. OK, how many of you consider themselves as backend engineers? OK, that explains that. Uh, so uh, with Polymer, the thing that we're trying to solve is that Reusing web components is actually really hard. There's a lot of ways of solving that problem, but so far all the solutions that I've used so far were not really uh, suitable for me because there was a problem which is uh, your CSS, if you change something in your CSS for one, it will actually change that property for all the elements and so on. Polymer solves that problem using one thing that's called a shadow DOM. Just, I'm not gonna get into much detail, but basically it's something slightly new that helps you have completely independent pieces of HTML that you're gonna be composing. The good thing about this is that it helps you reuse components so easily that we actually use that to provide components to write with material design. And material design is how Google is designing the new products. Uh, so that's actually, if we go back to this page, this thing that you can see that that beautiful uh, effect and uh, how this works and so on, all of this is, is actually uh, material design. And the cool thing is that this is actually just like maybe six lines of HTML to generate this beautiful template. And I don't know if you saw before, but there's that text going up. That's cool. I don't know how to do that. So, oh, I broke that again. So yeah, let's code. Uh, first of all, how many of you have written Go before? I, let's do the question the other side around, actually. How many of you have not written Go before? Okay, this should be okay. It's gonna be, uh, and if, there, if it's not, if there's something you don't understand, just ask questions. Go is very easy to read. That's one of the best things that Go has. But if there's something that is not clear and I don't explain it, just interrupt me and I'm happy to explain. Cool, so we're gonna start doing the backend. And the backend has two pieces. Uh, so there's two files. One is what we call the app.yaml. And the app.yaml is basically just describing what this is. And I'm saying, oh, this is an application and this is the application, the, the ID. So this is a project ID that I got when I created an app engine app. This is a given ID that you choose at project creation. I'm gonna say that this is the mod module default uh, because we're gonna have two default and the front end. This is the version one, runtime one, uh, Go, and API version Go one. So this is just saying this is a Go app engine app. That's everything. And then we have handlers. So handlers, we're gonna be matching different paths to different handlers. So we could have static uh, files, uh, we could have uh, Python, we could have whatever we want to have. Uh, this specific keyword 
says that anything, so any request, will be redirected to be handled by the Go app. So what we're, what we're writing. And we say secure always, so everything will be always redirected to HTTPS, which is always better. Cool. So on the other side, that's everything we have. And this is an app engine app. Now, this one doesn't do anything so far. So what we're going to do is we create an app engine app that actually does something, that just prints hello world to start with, with, that, with something. Uh, you will see that when I save, new things will appear on the top. That's, those are the import statements. And there's a tool, Go Imports, that will do that for me. So I don't have to remember to put them on and off and so on. OK, so the first thing that I have to do is to say, how do I handle my requests? And to do that, I will use the func init. The func init is a function that is executed at the beginning of the program, before main. So this, between the viable declarations and the main function, there's init that, can, that, that is executed. So we're going to say, I want to handle anything that matches that, your, that path. So everything starts with a slash, so everything. I want to handle that with my handler. Cool. And what is a handler? Well, oh, HTTP. So a handler is something that looks like this. So actually, I know I write like this. It's an HTTP handler. It's a function that receives two parameters. The first one is a response writer on which I can, I can write things. And the second one, it's the pointer to the HTTP request. So you have an HTTP request that contains all the parameters, cookies, and so on. And the response writer, you can set the headers and then write things into it. Cool. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to call println hello. And now the thing is that if I print it, I'm not printing anywhere. I'm just printing it probably to nowhere. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to print to the output. And the output is W. And for that, there's actually F println. So fprintln, if you've done some Unix, fprint actually writes to a file descriptor. In Go, it writes to something that we call writer, which uh, response writer is a writer, so you can write into it. Cool. So this is a complete app engine app. Let's try it. So I'm going to do go app serve of step zero add.yaml. No, step zero only. So go app will run this locally, and it will start my local host 8080. So it says, OK, I'm ready. I'm running. It compiled all the code. Uh, it didn't, uh, the code compiled. The code compiled, so it didn't complain. And now we can open that and see a beautiful home page. There you go. So now we have, now we have our first app working. Uh, something interesting is that when you're working on development, you could say you can change this, save it, refresh, and you get it. So it, when you're doing uh, developing development, it's actually really useful to keep that working all the time and seeing how the what the answer you get. If you do something wrong, like breaking the code that won't compile, you will get your compiler errors on the on the page directly. It doesn't look that bad in general. Just very big, but saying, yeah, something wrong happened there. So we can save it, refresh, and it works again. Cool. So now what I want to do is I want to uh, write every single time there's, um, there's a request to my posts. So now I'm going to say only posts, just list the posts. OK, so for now, we don't have anything special. And what, I want to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat. And I'm going to say, you know, the post should be, uh, should be JSON. I'm going to define a constant, which is a JSON. Uh, it's a string constant that contains all the posts that I want to send. And I'm just going to write that instead. Cool. So I'm just sending that constant into the output. Oops, 404. I need to say posts. And I have JSON. Now this is a REST API. 
it's technically a REST API. It's a very useless REST API, and it has some issues like, what happens if I forget this comma here? Well, your front end will crash. That's everything that's going to happen. Your back end will not know. So OK, let's try to make it a little bit better. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a type that matches that, that object. So in Go, you can say type post is a struct. And a struct is pretty much like a class. So it has fields, and uh, every field has a type. I'm going to say I have my UID, which is a string, my text, which is a string, username, which is a string, avatar, which is a string, and favorite, which is a boolean. Save, put it there. And I have to write all of those in capital letters, because in Go, if you, if you write lowercase, it means that that field or type or whatever it is, it's not visible from outside your package. So when we're going to try to encode something into JSON, the JSON encoder will not be able to see it. So I have to put those. Um, so now I'm going to say my posts is actually a list of posts. And I'm just going to put this here. Uh, so I'm just going to remove this, this, this. Because you, you don't really need to have those names there in Go. OK, and that works? No, doesn't work. Oh, you need those commas there, too. There you go. OK, so now instead of JSON, we actually have a Go object. That's a Go value. It's a list of posts, green and Go. And if we don't change anything, what we're doing is writing that pause directly to the output. So let's see what, what we get. We get something which is pretty much what we want, except that it's not JSON. Uh, but you have all the data. So let's try to make that encode JSON for real. So to do that, we're going to use uh, the JSON package, uh, which is encoding JSON in Go. So you can, do, you can create a new encoder. And when you create a JSON encoder, the only parameter that it requires is where are you going to encode those things. So what's the output? In this case, the output is the same output as before. It's W. That's an encoder. And I need to call now encode. And I'm going to encode those posts. Now, if I do this, that already works. That's already JSON. Right? But there's a problem, which is encode returns an error. And I'm not checking it. So in Go, there's no exceptions. You have to handle those errors yourself. So if the error is not nil, we're going to uh, log an error. So we're going to say encoding that fail. So that will actually print it. OK, so now we have something that's slightly more robust. And yeah, it still works. Cool. Now, imagine that we keep on adding more and more of this. Uh, there's things that are going to be common all the time, which is encoding JSON, decoding JSON, and then doing this handle func of my URL to whatever I want. So all of these things, if you write your REST API like this, you're going to have to write them yourself. And it's going to be boring pretty fast. So instead, what we're going to be using is we're going to be using, um, actually, before that. Um, yeah, before that, before moving to using cloud endpoints, we're going to see how to use the data store instead. So right now, all the posts are here, right? Uh, the post should not, whoops, I broke something. The posts should not come from a local variable. They should come from the database, from the data store. So let's use that instead. So I'm not going to change anything here. What I'm going to change is I'm going to say, OK, I want to create, I want to access the data store. In the, on App Engine, every single time you try to do something that is involving other than your instance, so your own uh, memory, you have to use a context. And that helps you 
uh, have uh, the permissions and also link different requests together. So then you can see the logs for everything that was done because of a given request. To do that, we're going to import App Engine and create, it, create a new context. So that's going to App Engine, new context of R. Now we got it. Now we have a context. Next step is we're going to do a query. And to do that, we're going to use the data store. To use the data store, App Engine data store. Whoops. Uh, and data store has a new query. New query, what it receives is the kind of object that you're looking to retrieve. So that's pretty much the equivalent to the table name in a relational database. So we're going to call it, all of these are posts. So I'm going to call that a post, the kind is post. And then I can do a lot of things. I can add uh, filters. So say, oh, I only want the posts from this user. I only want the post uh, with this picture or with no pictures and things, things like that. I just want all the posts. So I'm going to call get all. Get all gets two parameters. The first one is the context. So you, every single time you're doing something outside of your instance, you need that context. So we're going to pass it. The second one is the destination. And the destination is going to be the list of posts. And to do that, actually, we're going to create a list of posts that is empty. So rather than having all the posts from before, just go, we're going to create an empty and use that to retrieve. Uh, when, we, when we call get all, that will return two things. It will return all the keys from all, this, all, all of those object, objects and an error. In Go, when you write in Go, you're going to see there's errors very often. If that fail, uh, we're just going to log an error. Uh, so uh, fetching, fetching posts fail. Going to log that error and return. Don't do anything else. Otherwise, I'm going to encode those posts. So that's exactly the same. So that's it. Now, rather than creating our posts from scratch, we're just re uh, retrieving those posts from the data store. Let's see if that compiles. It does not compile because this is already defined. So and you're not using keys. I'm not using keys, indeed. You get a gopher. Who was it? <laughs> you get a gopher. Uh, OK, and did we get something that I cannot see? Uh, I have the problem that, I don't know, what's happening here? Um, yeah, but this should still encode something, though. Um, No, they're not, but they should still print an empty, an empty list. Let's see. See, error, oh, something might have failed here. And uh, so I'm going to display the error here, encoding error. So let's try it here. We can go to the logs and see that it's an invalid data type. Because I'm passing a list, but I want to modify the list. So if you want to modify something in Go, you have to pass a pointer. So we have to pass a pointer to the list. That's it. That way, the data store will be able to modify that list and add all the posts that I want. OK, let's try again. Cool. Empty list. We don't have anything in it. Uh, now, the next step could be uh, doing all the, all the different endpoints. So how to add a post, how to add the favorites, and so on. And the problem is that if you start doing that, again, was that what I was saying before, you're going to have a lot of boilerplate code that is repeated over and over. So instead of doing that, what we're going to do is we're going to solve the problem using uh, cloud endpoints. So with cloud endpoints, what we need to do is we, we need to define a type that it's going to be our API that contains all the endpoints. So it's going to be list, add, and set favorite. And then you have to register that. So let's see step by step. So 
here we're going to do endpoints dot handle and now listen and handle listen and handle is that correct no it's not correct let me cheat for a second uh, no okay this is the one and this is the one I'm working on so this is the uh, import statement to use Go endpoints. That's where the library is. And actually, if you get this URL and you go directly to GitHub, you will see the code. So that's pretty useful. OK, so now I can actually use, no, what, endpoints? Um, let me cheat a little bit more. Uh, register, sir, uh, handle HTTP, OK. So, Handle HTTP. And handle HTTP, what it's going to do, it's going to do all the handle functions that we were doing before. That's going to be automated directly from the type that we're registering. So, OK, so let's create that type. I'm going to create my type. I'm going to call it post API, which is an empty struct. It doesn't have any data inside, but it's going to have methods. So, we're going to define the methods list, add, and set favorite on that type. So now, our list post is going to be uh, the method list on the type post API. And this is how you define methods in Go. So uh, now, I, it, given a post API, a value of post API, I could call list on that, and that could work. Now I have to change some more things. I actually get directly a context. So I can remove this thing here. And Rather than getting a request and a response, I get, I get to choose what I do. So you can, the simplest one is this. It's just a list. It's a method that doesn't do anything and could fail. So it will return an error. But we actually want to return something more. We want to return a list of posts. So to do that, there's one extra thing that we need to do, which is every, so if we return something or we obtain something, it has to be a pointer to a struct. So we need to define a struct that contains a list. So I'm going to call that posts, which is a struct that contains uh, lists. That's it. OK, so now I can say return posts and an error. Let's make it a little bit smaller. There you go. Uh, now. I don't need to do this. So I'm going to start creating my context. I'm going to go fetch all the posts. And then I don't need to do all the encoding. I just return a post with the posts that I had. Oh, sorry. I removed the line that I didn't have to remove. That line, we still have to, to have it. That's the list of posts. So we're retrieving all the posts. But now all of these parts where we're encoding, you just return Posts and no error. And instead of logging those errors, you can return nothing and the error. So now we have the whole, the whole code. It's just that. It's get all the posts from the data store. If that fail, return that error. Otherwise, return the posts and no error. That's everything you need to do. Uh, almost. Now what we have to do is we actually have to tell endpoints that this is the service that we want to, to, to use. So we're going to use register service. We have to pass a value of our API. So I'm going to pass a post API, a value of it. So that's an empty post API. And then there's many parameters that I don't remember. So I'm going to go to documentation. So uh, go endpoints, go dot, dot org. Okay, so documentation for endpoints, register service. It has the service itself, the name, the version, the description, and if it's default or not. Cool. So the name, it's going to be called posts. The version, v1, the description. Post API, 
and is default, I'm going to say that, yes, it's default. So that's the default version of my API, basically. Uh, now that's it. Uh, let's try and see what happens on this. 404, which is normal. And I need to do one more thing. So the endpoints is something that will, exp will expose a REST API. And that REST API uses exactly the same technology as the REST APIs that we use at Google. So basically, if you have used before things like cloud storage or even the data store has a REST API, all of those REST APIs are based on this technology. And they're exposed in a very specific path. We have to make sure that that path is accessible. And to do that, what we're going to do is change our app.yaml from what we had before, uh, that everything goes there. We actually have to say this path. And SPI is actually a service point interface, which is, I think, the technical name for cloud endpoints. So basically, we're saying, uh, OK, so if, go to, if it goes here, it's handled by cloud endpoints. OK, so now, why did we do this? So now, if I go to a underscore AH API Explorer, I get this really cool thing, which is my API Explorer. And I can explore the API that I just wrote. I can say that there's a method, pause.list, and I can call it and see that it returns absolutely nothing. Now this, at least for me, this is really cool. This, uh, this allows you to test really easily. Uh, and this is exactly the same technique that, so this is based on the same technique that generates the code and so on. So, okay, now we have something that, that works pretty well. Let's add the add method. So, uh, func post API. Add. See endpoints.context. Error. Okay, let's think about this for a minute. What's, what's the parameters that we need in the request when we want to add a request? Well, we need pretty much all of this, but actually there's two things that we don't need. So I'm gonna create a new type that I'm gonna call add request. The UID, you don't get to choose that. Uh, that's the, the data store will choose that for you, so you don't get to choose that. And you don't get to choose if your post is favorite or not. That's to, up to others to decide, so we remove that too. So we're going to say that the request that we get is an add request. And it will return an actual post and an error. So the post containing the UID and so on. So this will be the actual, the final post. So let's do this. Now, the cool thing is that this, this already handles the decoding from JSON to our type, to the type of that we just defined. So we don't have to care, uh, care about that. If the URL, if the post, if the object that we receive doesn't match the description of this ob uh, object, we, they, will, they will get a status, it will get an error that will be something like bad request, which I don't remember what number is, but there's a state uh, status for that. Okay, so we have our request. Cool. What do we do with it? Well, I'm going to create a new post. So uh, P is going to be a post that's going to have text. It's going to be r.text. Uh, username is going to be r.username. And avatar is going to be r.avatar. Cool. And I'm going to save that into a data store. So to save it, I'm going to use data store dot put. And put has three parameters. The first one is the context. Again, every single time you do something outside of the instance, there's a context. Then there's a key. And what's the key that we want to give to this uh, node? Well, we don't know. And there's a, there's a way of creating those keys, which is new incomplete key. When you create an incomplete key, basically you're saying, I know the kind, I know this is a post, but I don't know the actual ID. You choose it. So again, context. The kind we said it was post, and the parent is if you have ancestors. And that's a more advanced topic that we're gonna, we won't talk about today. So I'm going to go with no, there's no ancestors. We're going to use that key. And then the source is going to be our pointer to P. So we're going to say P 
key into the data store. And that returns a new key and an error. So that key is actually the new key that actually contains all the data. If the error is not nil, then we're going to return nil because we didn't create any new task and an error. So you can create a new error saying uh, put post and the error. So Francis, yeah. So on, on the errors here, so I'm kind of like a little bit of old fashioned and, and I'm still kind of learning go, but um, it seems like you're always handling the errors whenever you are dealing with a function that, that goes across any sort of interface boundary, is that right? Uh, I'm handling with, I have, I'm, repeat that question again, please. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm, uh, so. What happens, I, if, what happens if I don't do that? If you don't do that, if you ignore that error, then your code will have this in here. And this is basically saying, I know there's an error, but I don't care about it. And the effect of that is that if there's an error, you won't do anything about it. So you will continue with the rest of your code. So you have to, in Go, you have to write uh, this kind of code where you check if something failed every single time. Now, this might seem like something boring or exhausting at the beginning, but the cool thing is that you will not forget any error. So you will get to code that is robust way faster than with exception code. I still write a lot of uh, Python, and with Python, I have that issue. With Python, very often, during my tests or even once it's deployed, I realize that there's some uh, some case that I didn't think about, and there's an exception. And probably it will just catch all the exceptions and just say, oops. Uh, with Go, you actually forced to think about the errors from the beginning. So, so yeah. Uh, so now if that actually worked, uh, we actually got uh, our new, a new task. I'm just going to return the task. And so I, I said that the post, the task, the post, sorry. I'm going to return the post, which is a pointer, and no error. No. Cool. So let's see if that works. No. So I will show how to do that in a minute. OK, so now we refresh this. Now we have list and add. So let's try to add. So I'm going to say the username is Francesc, the text is cloud endpoint rules, and the avatar is going to be whatever image we had before. Uh, go on, go for logo. This one here this time, oh, whatever. So view image, cool. So we're going to use that one. Execute, and the response was 200. Avatar favorite text, UID is empty, indeed. So the UID is not set. And we have the username. Cool, so how do we do this? Well, actually, we have to get the key that we got and put it into the, into the object itself. So let's do that. So everything we need to do is p.uid equals, and now you could do something like key.encode string. So this will actually return a string. Right, so you basically encoding that key, which has a lot of information, into something that it's easy to send through HTTP, so you will be able to use it from your web pages and so on. But there's even a, and this should work, by the way. <laughs> Let's try it. Um, so if I run exactly the same thing, now it works, and I get this, this object here. Now, there's a better way of doing this, which is in Go, there's, uh, the typing system that we have is similar to doc typing. It's not doc typing, but it's similar. And there's a thing that you can do, which is uh, ask if a type satisfies, if a value satisfies an interface. And there's an interface that it's basically saying, do you have a special way of encoding to JSON, which is a JSON encoder, actually. So, and the data store key, it's actually one of those. So what we can do is we can say, this is a pointer to data store dot key. This is a data store key. And now I can just set it there. 
The cool thing, this won't change much. So this will still work. The cool thing is that now the decoding of that will also work. So if I get a, 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 a key, an encoded key directly, it will just decode it to my actual pointer to data store.key, so I can use it directly. Cool, so let's see if our list still works. No, data store cannot field UID, just type mismatch, yes. So the problem is that if you change the values of the data store, like we have, we have now we've stored uh, strings and we're trying to decode them to uh, keys and that doesn't really work. So we need to uh, app config. There's a way of removing the data store so we can start from scratch. Uh, download data, no. Clear. No. Do you remember this? No. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, oh, I think it's clean, not clear. See, no. So let's see. Uh, probably, actually, let me see. Yeah, there, there's a local data store. Oh, because I'm stupid, it's not app, it's dev app server. That's a local thing. Uh, so that's dev app server clear. Wow, that's bad. Uh, clean, no, oh, grab clear. Oh, that's clear, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, let me just find it. Um, clear data store. Clear, everybody sees it except for me, that's bad. <laughs> clear data store, I got it, okay. So now I can run dev app server slash clear data store uh, dot, no, uh, step zero. And that's pretty much the same thing except that it fails, oh, equals yes. Cool, so th this is actually the old thing we used to use with Go, we don't use it anymore, but there's some things that we haven't had like this thing yet. Cool, so now I'm just gonna go to my Go app as before. So this basically just removed everything from the data store. So if I execute the list, just returns an empty list. Uh, if I execute add, avatar, no, yeah, okay, that whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's data store, data store, clearly data store. And that's it works because we're not actually checking that that's anything valid. And we're getting the UID that matches what we expect. And our list, if you execute it, we get that list. Cool. With nil. So what's happening here? Well, the thing is that we, we didn't store that key, right? So in our code, when we store the post in the data store, we didn't store the key because we didn't have it. So there's two options here. One is well, I'm just going to store it. So I'm going to store it, get the key, and store it again, which is not a very good idea. The other option is not to store the, the, the object completely. Don't, don't store the key in the data store. Now, to do that, then what I need to do is I need to use the keys that I received here. So basically now, when I get all the posts and the keys, I'm going to go and put the pod, every single key in every single post. So for um, I key range keys, post of I dot UID, what? Uh, dot UI, I'm doing some uh, posts of I UID equals key. And now I will run it again. That should work. There you go. Now we have it. Now, there is one more thing that we can do, which is, we can actually say, oh, but I don't want to store the, the key at all. And to do that, what we're gonna use, it's something that it's called the field tags. So it's just a string, and you can say, the data store name for this object is dash. And that means don't store this. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is, whoops, 
I broke the thing. Uh, data store. Uh, why did I break? Let's see here. No, didn't break anything yet. Let's refresh. Execute. Bad request. Why bad request? Uh, cannot load field UID. Oh, because it actually stored that field on the data store. And now it says that that field doesn't exist in the struct because we just added the tag saying, don't store this. So the data store complains. So the solution, we already know that one. It's just clearing the data store <laughs> and starting again. So let's try again. Execute. It works. And if we, this is the last time I'm going to create a post, I swear. Well, I'm not going to swear because probably I'm going to create one more. But So it's Mr. Clear Data Store again. Oh, Miss Clear Data Store? I don't know. So that created it. We're going to go to list. We execute it. And now, posts is in, in uppercase. Avatar is in uppercase. Favorite is in uppercase. UID is in uppercase, and so on. And if you write JavaScript or JSON or anything, you know that in JSON, all the fields are in lowercase. How do we fix that? Well, using exactly the same technique as we used with the data store. So we're going to say the JSON name for this is UID. The JSON name for this is text. The JSON name for this is username. And the JSON name for this is avatar. And the JSON name for this is favorite. Uh, I see there's a type uh, here. Okay, <laughs> it's like I see there's a type of one. See that okay. user name, favorite text, user name. Is that good? Yeah, that looks good. Okay, so now we're gonna execute that again, and now we have all the names as we want. Ah, we're missing posts. So posts is going to be called JSON posts. Cool, let's see that. Cool, it works. Now we're going to write the, the last part, which is set favorite. And now set favorite is pretty interesting because what we need to do is we're going to get a UID, so the, the ID of the task that we want to change, and the value of the Boolean that we want to send for favorite, so true or false. And what we need to do is we need to fetch that post, change it, and store it again. Now there's a problem with that, which is what happens in the meanwhile, someone fetch that post, changes the name, and puts it back. And then, in the meanwhile, we save it afterwards. That's a, pretty much a data race. So we could, we could actually have problems with the data not being consistent. So a way of, the way of solving that is using, um, I forgot the word, transactions. So we're going to use a transaction. We're going to create a transaction, in the, uh, and inside of that transaction, we're going to fetch the post, change it, and put it back. And that's one single transaction. If we say that that failed at some point when we're saving or whatever, it will not change anything. Or if, some, if the object that we got changed while we were doing our transaction, that transaction will also fail. OK, so let's write that. Going to create a new endpoint, post API. And I'm going to call it, say, favorite. And it gets endpoints.context. And we return an error. And I'm going to call that uh, set favorite request. That's a pretty long name, but whatever. Going to define that as a struct. And now, what do we need in here? Well, we need the UID. So that's uh, the data store key, which we call, actually we need to rename it. When we're decoding, the JSON package will decode also, uh, if, even though the case doesn't match. So you can forget about that. that. That works automatically. And then we also need favorite, which is a Boolean. OK, so let's write it as we did before, pretty much. So we're going to get, so data store dot get gets a context, a key, 
and uh, the destination. So the destination is going to be uh, post. I'm going to call it post, OK, whatever. And I'm going to say store it there. Now, what is the key? The keys simply are the UID. That's the UID that we're getting. And we don't have to care about decoding it or anything because that cloud endpoint is going to do that for you. That will return something, an error. If that error is not nil, then uh, something bad happened. So we could do different things. I'm not going to explain this, but in, with cloud endpoints, you can actually handle different errors like not found. So in this case, it could be a good example to say not found. If that's actually not found, you can say it. But I'm just going to re return an internal server error of 500, which is the default. So uh, error f, uh, get post failed with that message. Otherwise, we actually get now, we got the post instead of the post. So post.favorite equals art.favorite. And then we're going to save it. So to save it, data store.put, the key, it's the same one, R-U-I-D, and the source is the same one, post. That will return a key that we don't care about this time, and an error. If the error is not nil, then we're going to return an error saying uh, save post, or update post, maybe, update post, that failed with that message. And otherwise, we're going to return nil. And that's all the code. Now, where is the transaction? Nowhere. We didn't use it yet. So to use a transaction, the way you do it is you, do, you use data store running transaction. And running transaction has three parameters. The first one, a context. Again, you're going to get used to using context. The second one is a function. It's actually a function that, given an appending context, returns an error which turns out to be exactly this. And then the options that we have, and we're not going to be using any options. Um, did I do something wrong here? Probably. This is not saving correctly. Funk appending context that returns an error. Hmm. Yeah, but this is not saving correctly. So let's see. Undefined app engine. App engine. Oh, now it worked. Now it actually moved it. Uh, that's a good thing with when you're doing Go imports and Go font and so on. If your code is not formatting every single time you save, you know that there's something wrong. With Sublime Text 2, the error message is very well hidden. <laughs> so it's better to go to the logs and see why it failed. OK, so and that, that indeed returns an error. So I'm just going to return, return the error. That's it. Sublime Text 2, this, a, this uh, software that I'm using. OK, that's version 2 of Sublime. This version 2 of Sublime. Yeah, that's the one I have a license for. So that's the one I'm using. <laughs> uh, so OK, let's see if that works. Let's refresh. That's bad. Uh, no new variables on the left side of that line 81. There's no error was already defined there, so you cannot you don't need to redefine it. Let's refresh. Okay, so the post API now have has the three methods that we want to use. Uh, at list and set favorite. And set favorite is ugly. I want that F to be capital letters. So we're gonna see how to change that. So let's try it. So I'm gonna get that one. I'm gonna get the key. And then I'm gonna go back, go to set favorite. What did you do? The property, and for the UID, I'm going to say the UID that I just copied from the other one. In favorite, I'm going to say it's true. Going to execute it, and that returns 204, OK. OK. If we go back and we go to the list, we will see that now favorite is indeed true. Cool, so we have our whole API. I'm just going to change one thing, which is I want I want set favorite to actually be named set favorite with the capital F because I like to be uh, to have code that is readable. To do that, to do that kind of things, you actually 
have an API and an error that I should have handled, by the way, and I forgot. Uh, so if the error is not nil, here, that's, that's really bad. If you're not able to register your API, you cannot do much. So I'm just going to log fatal. That's going to take it down. And otherwise, API has a method, which I don't remember. Uh, let's go to the documentation again. So go.org, go endpoints. Um, I think it's by name something, method by name. So method by name, given a name, it returns a service, me service method. So we're going to do that. So uh, service by name, set favorite. That's the name that we had initially. So it, the name of the method. And that's going to return a method. And service method, we have, that's not the good me method by name that returns service, me service method. Service method. Hmm, that's wrong. Service, ah, no, info, sorry. OK, so service method has a, fun, a method. That's hard to say. Service method has a method that returns a service info. And that's the one we're going to use. So info. Info. And that has some info. And the method info. And method info has a lot of things. We're just going to change the name. So name is the one that it will generate the JavaScript, uh, the name for the JavaScript, generate the JavaScript. So I'm going to say info.name equals set favorite. Let's see if that worked. So if I refresh, uh, Method by name, yeah, that's that's why. Not service by name, method by name. Thank you. Refresh. Cool. And now you can see set favorite. So you can actually uh, determine what kind of code you want to generate. And this is really useful because the next step that I did was uh, I got all of this code and I. So how many of you have gone through the Polymer tutorial? Okay. So basically, I got the Polymer tutorial, and there's one thing which is called the, the I think it's called Note Service or Post Service, something like that. What I did was just to change just that file. So I'm going to show you that file now. So the front end has a bunch of things, and one of the elements is this Post Service. And now, what I'm saying here is I'm using an element, which it's the Google API loader. And the Google API loader, I'm giving it the ID of my app, and the name of the API, and the version that I want to load. Now, when that's loaded, it will actually call, it will actually fire an event, and I will serve that, I will save that API. And from, that, from now on, the only thing I need to do is, oh, if you want to get the posts, call the method get posts. If you want to add the posts, call the method add posts with the post that you just received. And if you want to set favorite, this is how you do it. And that's everything you need to do. That's all the, 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 this, all the glue that you have between the front end and the back end. And it's auto generated uh, completely. And if you want to do a similar thing for, for uh, an, Android, an Android app, you can have the same things. You, get, you can get some code that is auto generated completely, and you will be, be able to call it. Now, the good thing with this is that if you change something in your code, you don't have to go and change all the, so depending on what you're changing, if you're changing a type, for instance, probably your code will keep on, will keep on working. If you add some new methods, uh, if you will just get more methods and your code will not break. So it's a very good way of maintaining a single code base that generates all the, all the endpoints for your different apps. So just to try that, now what I'm going to do is, I'm going to serve both the step zero and the front end. Fr uh, sorry. So when you do that, you actually have uh, step the YAML and front end the YAML. So now I'm serving both the front end and the back end. And let's see if that works. So 
Now you're going to see that there's 8080, 8081, and yeah, that's it, 8080 and 8081. So I'm actually missing. So I have the front end and the back end, but I need one more file, which is the dispatch.yaml, which is here. Dispatch.yaml, what it says, it says if that contains the underscore AH SPI, that's for the default, which is the back end. Otherwise, send it to the front end. And that's all the HTML, CSS, and so on. So now this is basically what it says where to send the request, to what module you should send it. So I'm going to add that. So I'm going to add dispatch.yaml. And we'll see that now it started 8080 for the dispatcher, 8081 for the default, and 8082 for the front end. So what happens if we go to 8080? We will see, wow, that's big. <laughs> so we will see, this feels like cheating. Why am I getting this? Oh, I know. So I'm, I'm actually cheating there. So the problem here is that the front end and the post service, so uh, you want to make sure that in development mode, your front end is actually using the API that your back end is exposing, not the one that is exposed on the, on the uh, production one. So the way to do it is just saying, this is the route that you should use. And that's it. So let's try it again. Ah, API sounds better, though. Uh, OK, so let's try localhost 8080. And there's nothing coming. Sad. What happened? Let's see the error. Uh, it's a bad request for getting. Is our backend down or something? No, that should just work. Now, of course, the demo, the demo part, which is the cool part, will not work. Uh, localhost 8082? 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80. Sorry? I think it's 8081. 8081. Now, there's something, something wrong. Um, let me see. That's a very small message. Um, Let me actually see what I have in HTTP. Oh, HTTPS. Now, HTTPS slash localhost 8080. I think that's how it's supposed to be. Um, oh, no, it's not this one. Uh, so one second, please. Let's see the documentation for that. Uh, Google API guy and loader. So. Google API loader. No, not that one. Polymer. Uh, Google sign in, Google API Polymer. Uh, this one here. The documentation is here. OK. It's supposed to be good. Why? It's API. It's API. It's your fault. It was API. Huh. It's actually your fault. Wow. Uh, with HTTP, I uh, not HTTPS. Wow. Shame on you. <laughs> okay. And did it work? No, undefined is not a function. I love JavaScript sometimes. Uh, cool, so I broke something, and I don't, I don't know what exactly. But I mean, it works on production, right? So, <laughs> so that should be enough. Uh, let, me, let me try to find the error. Plus service 23, uh, for service 23, get post. Oh, uh, the names are not good. So we have get post, and actually we called it list. So let's change that. This feels like it's actually preferred. It's not. 
Uh, okay, so let's go to change. Just gonna copy. So the method that we called list, it's actually set get posts. And the method we called add, I think it's add post. Uh, let's see that. Uh, the method add post, yeah. So we're gonna do that too. Add, add post. Let's refresh. Yes, yay, Mr. Clary the other store. Cool. <laughs> well, that image is kind of kind of not kind of wrong, but and now the cool thing is that you can keep on working with the rest. So uh, foo, bar, and now we're gonna actually use an image. So victory image, whatever that is. Yeah, that sounds like something I can use. Uh, right there. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, so this is how to build a modern web app. Uh, the rest of the code is, is going to be on GitHub soon, but that's actually not complicated. It's Well, if you know how to use Polymer, basically. <laughs> But uh, I think that this is a pretty good demonstration uh, on how to build an app from scratch. Uh, it's pretty simple. The code is very simple to understand. And the good thing is that if you had millions of users going to this app all of a sudden, it could just scale and work. <laughs>